Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Wabandato. I'm a program officer at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Uh, we've been doing these question and answer sessions. I call them town halls uh, for a little over a year. It was our response on how to continue getting information out to Indian landowners during the pandemic. I think that there's a lot of value in putting together these sessions on an ongoing basis, in addition to finally getting out into tribal communities and doing in-person events as well. Uh, tonight, we're going to address a little bit of agricultural leasing, but we'll spend much more time talking about grazing permits in Indian country. And I'd like to wrap our discussion this evening in talking about what Indian preference is in the agricultural world and what that might mean to you as a producer and or as a landowner. Tonight, we're joined by Brian Holmes. Brian is a rangeland management specialist for the Bureau of Indian Affairs at Cheyenne River Agency, and I'll have him do a more formal introduction. We're also joined by Preston Smith, who's a natural resources officer uh, with the Fort Hall Agency in Idaho. Uh, thank you both for joining us. And Brian, if you'll go ahead and introduce yourself, share with us uh, what you think is important about you and your experience. <clears throat> thank you, Jim. Um, like you said, uh, I work for Shine River Agency in South Dakota, um, the rangeland management specialist. I've been in this position for approximately 12 years. Um, and we deal with a lot of grazing lands. Um, so we've dealt with, you name it, we've dealt with about everything, but um, I'm just open to answer some questions and see where it goes. And Preston? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Jim and Brian. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm the uh, Natural Resources Officer here at Fort Hall Agency in Idaho, and I have been here for a little bit over three and a half years. Uh, my previous experience was uh, the Range Management Specialist at the Wind River Agency in Wyoming for about 10 years, about 10 years there, and then about another uh, five years as a range manager, excuse my voice, I'm experiencing a last bit of a cold here. Uh, range management specialist uh, doing range inventory at uh, Fort Duchesne, uh, UNO agency in Fort Duchesne, Utah. So um, I've worked quite a bit with uh, farm, or excuse me, uh, range uh, permitting, um, tribal assignments, that sort of uh, activity. And uh, my duties here at Fort Hall are uh, farm and pasture, and I do provide the uh, tribal, the tribes have contracted the program. So I do provide technical assistance to them here. So that's kind of the scope of my ag duties here at Fort Hall. Again, thank you both gentlemen. I appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll just jump in with the questions so that we can get started. Like I said, I do want to respect people's time and Recapture some of what we did last year. Can you, either of you or both of you, describe what an agricultural lease is and what value that has either to a landowner and or to an ag producer to have that agricultural lease? Uh, I guess I'll go ahead, Jim. Uh, so an ag lease through the Bureau is a contract um, done and approved by the superintendent. Um, it, it protects, like you say, it protects both the, the leasee and the landowners. Um, and it gives a lot of different options um, as far as conservation and stuff. But the main thing is uh, the landowner's payment, I guess, is a big one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for the benefit of both the, the leasee and the landowner. I'll, I'll tap into that just a little bit more, excuse me. You know, um, the leasee, uh, I guess there's a benefit, mutual benefit, uh, both for the leasee, he, he or she gets the uh, privilege to use that land out there as needed for their, their livestock um, use, livestock interest. And um, of course, we, we uh, try to follow uh, conservation, good conservation practices and, uh, adhere to proper stocking rates, these sorts of things. And uh, of course, with, with that in mind, 
you know, the, the landowner, uh, the benefit is, as um, uh, Brian mentioned, that there is that, that payment that goes to those landowners and in and, and dispersal. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's good land use, good land conservation, and um, it's, it's a benefit for, for the resource, for the tribes long term. Okay. Like I said, um, is there anything about agricultural lease that you want to make sure people understand before we get into the grazing permits? Like I said, yeah, and the really why I'm, before you get started, Preston, I'm sorry about that interrupting you. And before we jump in, like I said, we did cover agricultural leasing. So if there are questions, don't feel cheated that you can't ask those questions. I just didn't want to cover territory that some of our attendees have already gone through. So. Um, so for you guys, uh, like I said, any last pieces about ag leasing, but for the audience, you can ask us anything. Yeah, for the, you know, the ag leasing here at Fort Hall is uh, a major component of, of the resource here at this agency. And um, we deal with undivided interest um, on, on a lot of our landscape here. The farm in here is high dollar, high dollar farming. It's it's a cash crop, uh, potatoes, sugar beets, corn, and these types of crops. So, you know, the the value for that lease tends to go up based upon the amount or the uh, type of crop that is grown on these these uh, farmlands over here, and. Um, the really, I guess, you know, for me as a resource professional, the, the unique thing here is in Idaho, uh, the soils are really rich and um, temperate climate for the most part. So egg production is very high and uh, the landowners here are very sharp as far as their expectations for production and for uh, income to be received. So uh, I work with some folks that are, they're pretty much on their game. They know, they know the value of what's, what's coming into them. Okay. That's interesting. And Brian, anything else before we move on? Yes, absolutely. And, um, our agency, I guess we're more on the permit side. We have about 6% of our allotted lands are in leasing or leases. The rest is in permits, um, so very small percentage of the farming stuff that you talked about, but we do have a few. Okay. So then can you describe what a grazing permit is and how that differs from uh, ag lease? Yeah, so the primary difference is a grazing permit is revocable. Um, and in the case of Cheyenne River, um, our grazing permits are allocated strictly by the tribe themselves, um, where our leases are open, bid competitive. Um, there's a little bit, so with the grazing for the permits, it's strictly grazing land, uh, native land, uh, where land that's been broke or cultivated at some point isn't allowed to be in the grazing permit or permit, it has to be in a lease. So this is strictly grazing land. So if I understood what you were saying, if if at any point somebody's planted a crop on that land, it won't go back to grazing status at all. Well, I mean, if it was planted, river. yep. So if it was planted back to, um, let's just say native prairie or whatever, uh, there is a chance, but a lot of times it's been recorded at um, Farm Service Agency as cropland. So it has that distinction. And so then therefore it's you know, usually a lease. Okay. And you mentioned the the variation between tribal and, and allotted lands. And can you clarify a little bit more at Cheyenne River, how much of your land is grazed under tribe versus allotment? Yep, so our grazing permits are a big, I mean, multiple parcels put into one. Um, and so there's a lot of land mixed in with the tribal land. Um, a lot of, like Preston said, we deal, also deal with a lot of undivided, very undivided lands. 
some that the tribe also owns undivided interests in. Um, but they're they're joined together for common use, and um, like I said, even the the al the allotted land within the range unit is still allocated by the tribe on behalf of the landowners. Okay. And Preston, is there anything that you want to kind of describe? Sure, sure. Uh, over here in our neck of the woods, uh, the tribes, of course, have contracted that um, the range range program. So the way the, the tribe oversees that is they have what is called um, allocated, allocated um, AUMs and un, unallocated AUMs. I hope I'm saying that right. The allocated can you, are... Can you, can you say what an AUM is for our audience? An, a, an AUM is an animal uh, unit month. And then that is... Um, the amount of feed that it takes to feed a cow calf pair for one month. Uh, typically, it's a thousand pounds, although I understand I think it's now 1200 pounds now, since the animal carcasses tend to get a little bit bigger nowadays. So, excuse me, the allocated here uh, at Fort Hall is. Um, I hope I don't get these two mixed up because <laughs> they use they use the terms uh, pretty loose over here. So we we have a set of permits that are strictly for the tribal permittees, which I believe are the allocated, and then the unallocated. <clears throat> excuse me, which is the um, uh, allotted allotted lands. Those those lands or those permits those permits are primarily designated for the non-Indian permittees. And so what we have here <clears throat> is a bid system where the tribal members will come in <clears throat> and they will bid for their allotted AUMs or their allocated AUMs, excuse me. And there's a set rate on that based upon appraisal services for AUMs and they, they put in their bids and, and it's usually just about the same folks anyway, because there's, there's just such a small number of tribal folks that, that are running livestock over here. However, they do have a couple of big herds, big, bigger, bigger livestock herds that they're managing. And then you have what's called the unallocated, which is the allotted AUMs for bid by the non-Indian folks. And those also have an appraisal rate um, set for those as well. And um, quite often, it's, it's not unusual for the bid to go over and above the, the appraised rate um, on these, these range permits over here. And um, once, once those are all, uh, and, and like Brian said, they're, they're because these, these permits are set to running common. They, they, you know, because in some of the units, it's it's a combination of tribal land, allotted land, but they do run in common, and um, there are set seasons. Tip, our typical season over here is about a five month grazing season. Um, very, very few of the permits go to six months for the folks over here. Um, I think I think that's I covered that. I hope. <laughs> Okay. Well, that sounds good. Um, and as we're talking about AUMs, can you also talk a little bit about um, putting together an agricultural unit? Because I know most grazing permits are done over a over a, a, a managed unit versus, say, just my allotment. It might only be eighty acres. Can you talk a little bit about managed units? And the tribe's role in that, and the bureau's role. Um, what do you mean, Jim? Like, are you talking about like unitized tracks for one range unit? When you're saying yeah, that range unit, unit. that's that's the proper term. Thank you. Uh, um, that's why I need you guys because I'm not an ag <laughs> expert. <laughs> yeah. So. The Bureau and the tribe, if we work together on China River to 
um, determine the best use of that land. So a lot of times, you know, where it's mixed, tribal, allotted, um, we find the land that can be used together. Uh, and that's, like I said, forms one unitized range unit. Uh, sometimes our leases, we also have some larger leases with multiple tracks, but generally speaking, it's mostly range units that um, are unitized like that. A lot of the leases are single tracks. Okay. Over here, over here, Jim. Um, we have we have the the uh, what's called a um, land use group, and and they're they're elected officials from the from the tribe, and there are three of these individuals, and they they kind of help um, the bureau, the BIA, mm -hmm. um, to oversee resource management here on the reservation. Now that that includes grazing, the grazing, uh, the farm pasture leases home sites, um, anything related to natural resources here on the reservation. The Land Use Policy Commission um, speaks at, um, on behalf of the tribe. And of course, if, if necessary, on occasion, we, we do um, have an audience with the tribal councils um, when, when resource issues come up, these sorts of things. So we kind of have a, that third body to kind of help us focus um, on some of our yes resource issues, and as well, we have a uh, active extension um, office here at the at, on the reservation. So, in a sense, there we kind of got a little cadre of folks here to kind of work together to address uh, some of our resource issues within our within our range units or or leasing units as well. Okay. Uh, I had this pulled up earlier and then I moved it to get the uh, ag leasing for myself. So I kind of put out the essential requirements for a grazing permit. Could you talk a little bit about the process for obtaining the grazing permit for, I guess it would primarily be for ag producers, but it's important for the landowners to know this process as well. Um, it starts and it, with, oh, and I said it should be the same for both of you because yep. it's a bureau process. Yep. Um, as far as a lot of land goes, uh, starts with a, uh, it, it's 90 day notices for leases and it's, uh, I forget the term for the notice of the consent of the landowner to, um, allow it to be under the permit. Um, and then they have so many days to respond. Otherwise, uh, the superintendent can act on their behalf for the best use of the land. Uh, same thing with the tribe. They're notified. Um, and they if they approve to have it into the range unit, then uh, the permit is uh, issued and approved. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the status quo here is um, if uh, we, we get those permissions, those those uh, authorities out to those landowners and um, they give us, um, you know, the, the permission to include that land in those range units, then um, we move forward. And, and like Brian mentioned, if, if we don't get enough of a response, then uh, the superintendent, uh, by way of the CFR, can act on their behalf and uh, ensure that those lands are included in, uh, in, the, in, a, in a permit. For, for their best benefit. Okay, uh, we've got some questions that are coming in. And so as I've been adding the resources, I gotta kind of make sure I don't lose track too much. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. So one of the questions I had is what is an undivided interest for Fractional ownership within Indian country, an undivided interest is that partial ownership of an entire tract. I think one of the hardest things to get wrapped around with fractional ownership in Indian country is that uh, type of ownership. For instance, uh, for the most of Indian country, uh, they were using tenancy in common, which allowed for uh, fractional ownership and it would continue to grow 
exponentially. So if I had uh, 160 acres and four kids and a wife, when I died, my wife would get 50% and the four kids would split the other 50%. And then when she died, hers would get split. Uh, it didn't always go exactly the same between my probate and her probate in history. And so in that way, you ended up with over the successive hundred years of fractional ownership, a number of different undivided interests. And what the undivided refers to is the fact that the ownership is fractional, but the uh, tract remains intact. So that 160 acres is still 160 acres that can be used. I'd liken or, or try to describe that fractional ownership like having a voting share in the conversation related to that parcel. So if a right of way or a lease is going to be attached and I own 10%, then that means my vote has a 10% sway in that conversation. Uh, you know, my aunt might have, you know, 25% because she's a generation before me. And so her voice at that conversation can be louder. And we work with the numbers to say 25% of 160 acres is going to be 40 acres but my aunt would not own 40 acres of that. She would have her 25% over the entirety of 160, just as I would have 10% over the entirety of 160. So that doesn't, even though it may value in a way that looks like you own 40% or excuse me, 40 acres, which is 25% of the 160, you don't actually own 40 acres. You might own a 40 acres equivalent for value purposes but your voice is really what that is related to. I hope that helps. Um, so one of the audience members asked, Brian, if you guys work and deal with owner use units? Um, we do have a lot of strictly own use land, uh, a lot of one over one tracks or tracks that, you know, there might be a couple undivided owners, but they all consent to lease outside of the bureau to generally a family member. Um, and then there's also what is called a owner managed lease um, where hundred percent consent is needed. Uh, and I believe we don't have any on Shine River. I don't know, Preston, if you've dealt with these, but I think they're 10 year leases and then they roll over for another 10. Um, it's kind of a hands bureaus, hands off kind of thing. If a landowner wants to do their own thing and um, collect the income themselves, that kind of stuff. Yeah, over, over here in our neck of the woods, um, we do have some owner's use. And um, you, you're right, it, it does require um, the additional landowners to agree to allow that owner to take that. And um, it, can, it can either be, it can either be, um, if they all agree to let the landowner take it, you know, he can, he, they can either decide to lease outside of the bureau, um, which is quite kind of risky because then the um, additional landowners take a chance that they may not get paid. We prefer and, and kind of push for the landowner, if he takes landowners use to go ahead and do the lease documentation through the bureau. That way we can continue to ensure that the um, additional landowners receive their their payments as due from the lessee, and um, there I you know some of these leases over here uh, before I got here were were ten year leases. However, in the last four to five years, which is just right before I got here, the agency moved back a lot of those owner leases to five year five year terms. <clears throat> And that was to allow for uh, an appraisal, but to also just to recertify that the landowners, the additional landowners were willing to let the one person um, to continue to lease those as an individual. And, and it's, it's kind of caused a little bit of a problem, but overall, I think we've, we've still managed to manage, get through that. And um, 
we we don't have a whole lot of them, but there we do have I don't know maybe just a small handful of those here. Um, um, like I said, we our folks they they really they're really sharp on on who's leasing that land and uh, and like Brian mentioned it, it most of the time it it is just for a family member that's not how it works out over here. Okay, next couple of questions from the audience. Um, I'll ask them both and let you guys kind of get into it. Uh, one is who determines the amount of money per AUM? Although uh, I'm not sure if I read that quite right. And then the other piece is um, if you can address the formula for calculating uh, stocking rates and carrying capacity, uh, is that something that there's like people can use out of a spreadsheet? That was the question. And if so, would they be able to get access? So again, uh, determines the money charged for the uh, range unit and then ultimately um, calculation of stocking rate and AUM Uh, here on Cheyenne River, uh, the tribe actually sets their own tribal grazing rate on all tribal lands. Uh, theirs is currently set at $10 an AUM, which is fairly low, but the tribe recognizes the value of having uh, tribal members operating on that land, doing the improvements, doing the conservation. Um, so they take that and also the money, the inputs that they put into it. Um, so they take that into account. As far as the allotted land goes, the regional office, uh, Great Plains, they uh, set the value uh, based on five-year um, Olympic average. So that includes rental rates in our counties, um, kind of factors in cattle prices. Um, there's a lot of other factors that they put into that, that calculation. Um, and then I guess uh, over here, uh, you know, the tribe as well, Brian, the, the tribes over here set the um, rate for tribal AUMs, which right now is $21 an AUM. But, and then as far as the allotted rate, the Office of Appraisal Services, um, they do their, their appraisal review. And it's, it's, it's kind of somewhat extensive. Um, we, we have to start about a year. We started a year and a half before the end of the permitting period. And that allows the, the, uh, that appraisals office to seek and, um, you know, outside leasing rates on grazing lands, uh, private, private, um, in either in our area or in our region. And we've asked them to do a region wide review since our area. Um, it's kind of a high dollar area for egg, egg products, egg production. So we thought that it would, it would be nice to include numbers from um, Oregon, um, Washington, and uh, Montana. That, that's kind of the core of our Northwest region is, is uh, these four states. So uh, they bring that information forward and then um, meet with the Tribal Council Land Use Policy Commission. And uh, at that time is when the tribe and the agency, well, the agency accepts the uh, um, allotted rate and passes that to the, the tribal councils. And so that's, those are the two rates that the range office um, works with. The allotted rate over here, um, we're looking at 29.50 per AUM for uh, livestock over here. Okay, I'm gonna intercept my question just to touch before we get into uh, the other part of that, uh, because you hit on the fact that the land buyback program has brought the tribe into ownership on a lot of, in a number of allotments. And um, so one of the questions I had gotten ahead of today was wanted to address an allotment in which the tribe may own a substantial portion of that allotment. Now, for instance, say 80%, and the remaining 20% is to the individuals. K 
can the tribe set their own rate different than and lower than the bureau's rate? So in other words, can there be two rates? And does is the bureau able to bill accordingly for those two rates? So Preston, you can touch on it if it's different, um, your agency, but uh, to my knowledge, they cannot. So the CFR protects the landowner, the, the non-consenting landowners. So in this case, if the tribe owned 80%, they would have the majority. Um, so they could obviously choose who to lease to. Um, however, they, the other landowners have to receive fair market value according to the CFR, um, which for us would be the rate set by the regional director, which we're actually at $17.91 for allotted land. Yeah, that sounds real familiar. We, um, we, we, we can, just like you just said, we, we, if a track is 80% um, allotted or uh, tribal AUMs, then they will get the tribal rate. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's the dividing line over here between what's allotted, all the allotted um, AUMs designated coming off of allotted lands or AUMs coming off of tribal lands, or, or if it's a track, it's a split like that. Again, it's just those those AUM numbers that'll take that split because the tract of land is still within the boundaries of a whole of a range unit. And, and I, it's probably going to sound a little confusing where, um, you know, you've got so many, uh, so many folks assigned those tribal AUMs and then so many folks assigned those, those um, allotted AUMs. And that's, that's, you can do the billing through that on uh, the, TAMS, the TAMS program that the BIA operates um, for, our, for our permits, leasing, all these other resource activities. Okay, and I wanna make sure we get this before we move on. And one of our landowners is asking about, can allottees set their own rate or do they have to accept what the Bureau provides? Uh, specifically, um, is there ability to have a negotiated grazing permit between a landowner and, or the landowners and a permittee. And he also was just kind of wondering with that 17 figure, is that per AUM or per acre, Brian? Uh, yeah, so that $17.91, that is per AUM. Um, our average stocking rate is around 2.5 acres um, per AUM. So you're looking at, you know, six, 650 per acre is what that roughly figures out to. Um, and then on the a lot T set in their own rate, yes, the CFR in 166 does allow for a landowner to set their own rate. Um, and we do have actually a fair number of those on Cheyenne River. Um, and especially if their land has something of greater value to that range unit, say it, it provides the water um, or protection or something of that nature. No, that's that's kind of the unique thing about our regions is um, each one of our regions operates under a little different guideline. <laughs> and um, over here, um, and and a lot can can set their rate. However. Um, the Office of Appraisal Services um, want, would want to see their, you know, their uh, background information related to this appraisal that the allottee has come up with. And, and they kind of exchange information. They can exchange information back and forth um, on what would be a proper um, rate or acceptable rate for the allottee. Um, but it, it, at this point, it's just a concept. It, it really hasn't come to fruition over here um, as the allottees are, you know, they, it's, the allotted rate here is very friendly. So, uh, you know, we, we haven't had any, <clears throat> any complaints regarding the allotted rate. Um, the interesting conversation comes up with the, the landowner, uh, that undivided interest question always comes up. And, um, we have some folks who, who uh, their interest is so small 
in through through these probates that have gone on over time that that in in reality they they really never gain any more land um it's it's kind of a set deal and they they get upset when the allotted rate goes up but they don't see their income going up and and i i try to explain to some of the folks that you really need to learn or uh be familiar with how to read your title status reports <clears throat> and understand how much ownership you have in terms of um, you know simple mathematics that that's that fractionated interest and uh, fraction being the key word there because um, once once your interests are so small um, you'll you'll never you'll never really gain a whole lot of extra dollars out of that value that that land that you have um and and that's just that's just kind of the way it, it is that's 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 the probate laws that have said all that which is all most of that's been done um you know prior to my my service as a federal employee okay thank you i want to try and reserve the last part of our conversation to tackle uh, Indian preference in this. Can you both address what you work with in regard to open bid versus uh, Indian preference? And and as you're addressing that, how does or how can Indian preference work in leasing and permitting? Um, here on Cheyenne River, um, the tribe actually has a grazing ordinance and a leasing ordinance that both specify. So uh, the grazing ordinance, it's uh, the grazing permits are for tribal members only and allocated by the tribe. Um, and then on the leasing side of it, they give Indian preference. Um, there's actually a tier system where um, tribal member residents um, come first and then tribal member non-residents and then um, open public. Uh, so if there's a piece of land and a, a tribal member bids in a uh, someone from the general public bids, the tribal member will receive preference. Um, and if there's cases where there are no tribal member bids, so then of course we go down the, and accept the general bid. Jim, I'm gonna answer that from the from the leasing side of things. Uh, you know, we, we do our uh, competitive bids for, for leases here on farm and pastures. And um, it's it's an open bid system for both tribal and for for non-tribal. When when a particular tract of ground receives a set value or a, a bid value from a non from a non-tribal person, um, the tribe, a tribal person who is bidding on that same tract and and at this at, at in this case it could even be the tribal enterprise agricultural enterprise uh, business here at Fort Hall. They can they can use their Indian preference and match match that person's bid um, dollar for dollar. And and usually what ends up happening is as as the bid number increases in value. The, the tribal person will, will match that and declare Indian preference. And most likely the non-Indian person will, will drop out. On, on our open bids on um, farm and pastures, we, we allow them to grow, go up in $5 increments. So for example, I may have a 200 acre uh, piece of ground and a farmer, may bid um, $180 an acre on it. And the, the tribal member will declare Indian preference. So he'll match that 180. And then the non-Indian will, will, will get that chance to go up to $185 an acre. And then if the tribal member declares Indian preference, he can match that 185. And it's just it just climbs up in those, those $5 increments until until either the non-tribal uh, member drops out of the bid or the tribal person no longer declares Indian preference and drops out of the bid. 
and and that's kind of how we do the Indian preference here on the farm and pasture leases. Okay, and so when Indian preference is applied, can a landowner opt out of that system? Yes, the simple majority is um, needed to opt out of any tribal laws, according to the CFR. Um, we don't have too many landowners that choose to opt out. Uh, we have a few. Um, the biggest thing is um, that non-member bid, they think there's a bigger pool of, of bids out there um, if they do opt out, but yeah, generally we don't have too many. Okay. Can you address the advantages or disadvantages of Indian preference? One of our one of our attendees has mentioned that in their grazing ordinance, Indian preference, he feels as though it stunts the rate of return for the landowner. So what are some of the advantages to Indian preference for a tribal community? Um, for us, I think that it keeps uh, the money local. You don't have outside people coming in. And I, I do agree with David um, that it can, in instances, it can stunt the rate for the landowner. Um, but the tribe has taken a stance that they, like I said, they, they value having um, native producers um, rather than outside entities coming in. Um, so they take that into account. Okay. Yeah, Jim, that probably that pretty much follows how, how things fall in order over here also. Um, you know, the, the community um, likes or uh, prefers the Indian preference. It allows the tribal enterprise folks to to uh, stay competitive in the farm and farm pasture leases. And we, we've got such a small number of tribal folks that are uh, farmers per se. Um, and uh, it allows them to be a little bit more competitive in, in the farming as well. But they're, they're, when, they, when they use that um, tool to their advantage, usually it's on the smaller farm acreages, um, you know, 40 acre tracks, 60 acre tracks, 80 acre tracks, these, these, these size, um, because the, when it gets to the, um, the farmer, the larger tracks here, we have uh, several allotments or tribe sections of tribal land that have been combined into thousand acre um, farms, you know, 1200 acres, 1600 acres. So they're pretty big over here. Mm -hmm. And and the non the non Indian farmers um, they're the bigger boys they're they're the ones who who are uh, super competitive on those, but the IP for the tribal folks it um, it it does give an advantage to the tribal folks to try to work their own land, and we do have some folks who prefer to have tribal members be their be their leasee um, on on their own ground. Now, Brian, you had mentioned that it keeps dollars there. What is what do you mean by that? How does that work in your experience? Yeah, I just think because um, if it is open for um, you know non-member bids, you get people from outside of the reservation, um, outside of the county, um, that aren't necessarily doing business locally. Um, and I guess that's kind of what I was referring to. Okay. I know my personal opinion has been that there are certain advantages to Indian preference uh, in that those dollars get collected and used on the reservation and that gives them the ability to be used again and again um, for non-agricultural purpose. But how I used to describe it on the reservation is uh, when the tribe opened up a grocery store, yeah, I might end up spending an extra 23 cents on a can of green beans and my grocery bill over the course of a month might be, you know, 15, maybe $20 more. And I guess maybe I'm lucky that I could manage to afford that $20. But part of that extra expense to me was the fact that, you know, my cousin and some of my uh, friends had a job. And so by me shopping at that grocery store, rather than going into town at, you know, the giant Walmart and 
saving a few bucks here or there is that again my cousin was having a job and my friends had jobs and that meant the money was going to get used over and over because once i shop at sam's club or walmart that money goes down to arkansas and it's never to be seen again so again i think you're right there are certain disadvantages to landowners that you're not going to perhaps get the highest and best return uh, and so that's something that you and your fellow landowners will have to consider when you're looking at those and deciding whether to opt in or opt out. I did post for everyone the Cheyenne River Ag Leasing for Farm and Pasture Code, as well as the uh, Grazing Permit Ordinance. And furthermore, uh, Brian and I had talked a little bit about what consent looks like. And so he did share with me the, the form that gets used for landowners to either consent or refuse uh, Indian preference on their allotment. So I wanna make sure you guys realize that that's in your chat feature and you can pull those up. Uh, they also are referenced in the original post from the beginning of the month, but our last week, let's see some of our last ones. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it says, uh, uh, and for Belknap, they send out a posting of opportunities to enrolled members first, and then only after they have no interest from them, open it up for a general bidding process. So I think that's another way that folks could take a look at Indian preference. Uh, we're getting close. We've got about five, six more minutes. Want to give... Uh, I'll start with Preston first, since I did Brian first the first time, originally. Uh, Preston, is there anything during our conversation that, um, oh wait, hold on. I did almost forget one question. Um, and this might be a good one to start wrapping up. Can you talk about some of uh, two or three of the most common misunderstandings that uh, individual tribal landowners have about ag leasing? and grazing permits? <clears throat> hmm. I think that, uh, you know, one of the ones that I that I run across, have come across as, as the, as a range manager was um, whether the person is a tribal or non-tribal when it comes to these permits perhaps even these leases, <clears throat> excuse me, man. A lot of folks tend to think that um, um, the, it's, it's, their, it's, it's their right to have a grazing permit. And, and we quite often have to remind them it, it is not a right, it is a privilege to be able to run <clears throat> livestock on tribal ground, allotted ground. And we get into a lot of um, uh, misunderstandings when, when folks, uh, you know, they want to expand their herd or they want to bring a family member in. There's, there's protocol on, on issuing a permit. Um, with a with a uh, with a fellow person, and usually, usually that's um, that doesn't work out too well. Uh, perhaps even a minor, perhaps put a minor on the on the permit. These sorts of things, and and I I you know I'm I'm all for longevity with our producers, and and that was something I always worked for, was trying to <clears throat> get that next generation, get them a foot in the door. But quite often the misunderstanding is um, a younger person um, quite often has to step out on their own with a smaller permit um, unless unless the tribes allow them to run in um, you know uh, as a co-permittee with with a, a parent or a brother or a sister or something. And um, to me, I, you know, I, I, I like seeing, I like seeing the tribal members continue onward, but, but there's, there's certain rules with that, that we got to follow just to ensure that, uh, that we've got, you know, 
compliance out, out on the land and landowners are getting paid. And, um, you know, we, we don't have just, just pale mail out on, out on the resource there. There is some, some sort of control out there on what, what's going on on the landscape. Brian, um, common misunderstanding that you've come across? Uh, yeah, I completely agree with Preston as far as people. Um, it's definitely a privilege to, to have a grazing permit or even an egg lease, but um, a lot of things that come be so well, a lot of the misunderstandings come from undivided interests, um, people not understanding what they have, they think. You know, they get their, their ITI and um, they think that they own more land than they do or they have control of it um, when they own just a small portion of it. Um, and I think that could be, there needs to be more education out there to these landowners too sometimes to help with that. But um, ultimately we, the BIA is, we have a fiduciary obligation to the landowner. Um, so they come first. Um, and I think that's another thing is, uh, these leases and permittees sometimes think that we are um, there for them first and foremost. And I mean, it, we're there for the landowners and the land is when it comes down to it. Okay. And like I said, uh, any last thoughts as we wrap up? We've got about three or four minutes about our conversation, about your experience with agriculture or, or whatever you want to share with our audience. It's your floor. Yeah, I can't really think of anything, Jim. <laughs> Preston, about all I can think of, Jim, is um, you know these these title status reports, these landowner um, interest reports that that the folks get. Um, if you if you don't understand, um, you know the the partial interest, um, go talk to an agency person and have them help you understand that document so you truly understand how much land you truly own you know brian makes a good point that a lot of times the allottees truly don't understand how much land they actually are speaking for and when you get that title status report it's it comes in there's there's two there's 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 there, it comes in a fraction numerator and a dom, denominator and it also comes in a percentile type number. And like I tell folks, when you look at that percentile number, if you've ever done math, it's basic mathematics, you take the decimal point, you go to the right of that decimal point and you start counting how many zeros are behind that decimal point, that should be a major indicator to you that your interest is going to be very small. And, and I can vouch for that because um, I have mineral interest back home in Wyoming and it's so small that um, the income that I receive, it takes me three years to get one penny. That's how small my interest is in minerals back home. So, so for folks to truly understand those, that, those documents, Talk to an agency person and they should be able to help you understand how much land you actually own in a given tract of, of, of a parcel out there. And, and a lot of folks would be under would be shocked to know. In some cases, it's probably one foot by one foot, maybe the size of a post hole. It all depends on how big your family is and how many people have uh, inherited interest in that particular piece of land. Okay, well, I appreciate you both and uh, kind of typing and talking at the same time. So uh, we had a lot of requests here at the end about ITIs and um, otherwise. So I'm going to add one last document reference. It's our cutting through the red tape. And in it, it talks about how to actually read those ITIs. Um, so I've just added that. 
And I will take that into account as we look at future sessions and future opportunities. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Uh, this has been recorded and we will go ahead and get that reference out to you. You should expect within the next day or so to get a follow-up email asking what you thought of the session. And certainly at the end of that, just like at the end of tonight, uh, take advantage to share what you'd like to have us address. I'm trying to make best guesses, but like I said, I do this. The Indian Land Tenure Foundation exists to make sure you have the information that you need so you can make the right decisions for your Indian land. Um, so again, thank you, Preston. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, the rest of the audience. We appreciated your attendance and um, look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for